I'm here, welcome to 23. You're joining me for X Files episode 9. It's late on a Friday. Caitlin keeps texting to see if I'm going out, but I'm still here, learning about what I can about Gregory Pierce. It's one thing about him as an investigative consultant firm, the Pierce Institute, that has been placed in charge over the X Files, but the way he miraculously saved Agent Fulton, me, and five others from death by hashtag has me concerned. And not just me, Fulton's worried about it too. How could Pierce and his chief researcher, whoever that is, deduce a complex series of passcodes to shut down the hashtag program? I've got rudimentary access to Pierce's vast case files from his time in the behavioral sciences. They're dazzling displays of lateral thinking. All I learn is that Pierce was gifted and loved the Bureau. Three files, cross-reference A.D. Skinner, maybe something is in those. Two of, the two of the Skinner references involve X-Files, a contortionist and a supposed lycanthrope, and one shows Skinner helping Pierce with a still unsolved serial murder case. Read the unsolved. This case was brought up in my academy training, 12 unsolved murders in upstate Massachusetts. At first, the perpetrator was thought to be a copycat of the Boston Trangler, who killed 13 women in the 60s. But the M.O. changed after three from strangling to beheading. All the women had unidentified symbols carved into their torso. Skinner loaned Agent Mulder to Pierce to look into the occult angle. Mulder nearly died in a fire that consumed the twelfth victim's home. The killer was near, never identified, and the case remains Gregory Pierce's only unsolved murder on the books. Before I can keep reading, my phone goes off. It's a video call from High Guys. Supposed founder of the Magic Bull Attacker Group. It's Friday night, Jessica. You should be out. Is Agent Dexler to you? Or just Agent? You didn't respond to my last text. I know. I'm the worst mystery informant ever. I heard about what you were dealing with with Hashtag. That was really something. I'd love to see the code the kid wrote. You've been useless. If you're gonna help me and won't be on your terms, when I reach out to you, I expect a response. I don't think there is anything I could do, but I hear you. You got some unmentionables and whatever. I'm assuming there's a reason for this call? Like, I don't know, maybe giving up the magic bullets like you said you would? They're wanted for hacking the FBI database to steal the X-Files for murder and a conspiracy. That's quite a list. We can't let them use the X-Files to facilitate murder like they did with the Martin Sneeberg Jr. in Philly, or any other way. It's not that simple. I told you. We're all anons. They don't know me, and I don't know them. But I'm working on that, okay? I got a couple of the, of the cities, some of the little details. But it takes time to finesse this stuff. There's gotta be something, some way, to expedite things, and you're no detective. Give me what you have and I'll work with it. Yeah, no offense, but you couldn't do squat with what I have unless you have full access to my tools. And that's not happening. Anyway, I'll do something for you, Agent Dexler. I'm sure you've heard about the deaths in Baltimore. Baltimore. While I was in California, two FBI field officers, employees were killed in house fires there. Of course, are you saying that the your playmates are targeting federal employees now? Are they making good on the threats for of revenge for Philly? No, it's not. What you need to know is that those fires were arsons caused by a subject of an old X-File. A 99% positive it's to cover up the murder of the FBI employees. But, I have no idea why they're being killed. Who's the next target? You need to tell me who's in danger next. We have to put a stop to this. They're not our targets, I swear to you. None of us have any idea who's next. Please, trust me on this. Trust you? Hey, do I look that naive? No. If anything, you look really, really... What? No, that's not on point. I don't want anyone else to die. Please. Look up the case file. Everything you need is there. The name is the Cecile Vivre. Please do it. With that, hey, ends the call, and I just want to slam my phone in the desk a million times. I start to cool down. I think about what Hay said. 
and I gave up my Gregory Pierce research read up on an X-File dating back to 1993. Special Agent Aaron Fulton. Stacy wrinkles her nose as she tries to build the best word out of the top letters tiles she's been given. You love when she makes that face. And you've received, uh, or relieved, she took a busy night off from the bar to be with you. Her presence alone helps you over get over another tough case. But despite your being home, relaxed, and suitably distracted, your mind keeps sneaking back to the Bay Area. A Silicon Valley blog reported that Ty Wright's been ousted from his own company to a uh, no-confidence vote by M.M. Wright board. According to the write-up, rumors are that employees confronted the board with the Wright's mis misogyny and mishandling of the R8R dating app. Wright's assistant, Jenna Mathis, is now interim CDO. She's promised to turn the app's reputation around and change the workplace environment. A hey, Agent Daydream, I said triple word score. Daisy's eyes narrow playfully, she's on you. You were at work again, weren't you? You can try it. Uh, guilty as charged. Sorry. <clears throat> you were honest with her. Well, it's hard to blame you when I'm kicking your butt so bad. She grins, you can't help but smirk at how much she enjoys teasing. Looking down, you see her latest word. Colleagues. Like Greg Pierce. I assume there were uh, things Pierce would keep from you, but his reluctance to discuss his chief researcher gnaws at you. Sherlock Holmes has nothing on this guy. You have to know the methods behind his uncanny deductions, or it'll drive you crazy. And to the colleague, just you continue to wonder about is just Dexler. As great as partnering with Ted Dexler has been, you have to place your full trust in each other, and that's another level altogether. You know she believes strongly in the X-Files as a case or cause, but she was recommended by the Senator with a questionable motives. It helps that she lets you in on her Magic Bullets contact and Skinner's request that she monitor the Pierce Institute. She didn't have to. Stacy sets her stemmed glass down on the force. With force, uh, thought arousing her attention, she prefers it to clearing her throat. Not to interrupt your strategy session, but speaking of colleagues, where am I going to meet your partner? See what she has in mind. And what were you thinking we'd do? Oh, we'd have her over for dinner, go out if that's more suitable, even just coffee. So, the doorbell chimes, you make a quick mental list of who it could be at this hour and come up empty. Stacy's already up to answer it. You follow, someone wishing you had a weapon handy. Stacy opens the door, and she gets her wish. It's Dexler. Hi, you must be Stacy. I'm Jess Dexler. Oh, you're kidding. We were just talking about you. Why don't you come in? And I don't mean to be... I really need to talk to Fulton right now. It's work stuff. Uh oh. Okay. Fulton, leave your phone inside. Seriously. You slip past Stacy, meeting her uh, concerned gaze with an apologetic shrug as you hand her your phone. You close the door behind you. Dexler looks rather serious, impatient, troubled. Uh, Dexler, what the hell's going on? Hey guys, the contact I told you about. He has information that uh, we have no choice but to act on. Dexler relays the facts regarding one of uh, Mulder and Scully's earliest X-Files. You don't recall it from your research as a Pierce intern. Cecile Levere was an arsonist who had murdered several people on the, of the British Parliament, while also taunting and obsessing over their wives. Levere followed his latest target to Massachusetts, where Mulder and Scully encountered and subdued him. According to reports, uh, Livelay was under heavy guard, being treated for severe burns on his entire body when he disappeared. Livelay's X-File states that he used accelerants to spread his fire, and suggests he used telekinesis to generate the initial flame. Now Hey Guys is telling me that Livelay is the one behind the two FBI-related arson deaths in Baltimore. He won't give me more than that. If that's true, if this is Livelay, why go dormant for so long to resurface now? I was wondering that too. It doesn't seem to make any sense. Frankly, I wouldn't expect him to still be alive. It doesn't follow a typical serial killer pattern. Unless there's some explanation for the long break, a working class clerks don't fit his. His encounter with Mulder and Scully ended rather poorly for him. Maybe he has an axe to grind? With a couple office clerks? Why not set the Baltimore field office blame? He's presumably able to. 
without knowing what's transpired in Livelay's life for the past quarter century. It's difficult to know for sure. Listen, Fulton, this isn't like the other cases. Sneemurg was killing under duress. The magic bullets blackmailed him. Du Ashtag has a program governed by rules. Livelay, by all accounts, is a homicidal psychopath, aggressive, unpredictable, malevolent, possibly with preternatural abilities. Dismiss her words. Uh, the mp has got a history of catching guys like him. He's just one more, nothing to be afraid of. It's kind of the attitude that gets agents killed on the jaw. It's healthy to take him serious. If it even is him. Doesn't matter who it is. Anyone capable of burning people alive is capable of killing us. Don't lose sight of that. The Baltimore homicides are already a federal case. That means we have to go to Skinner and Pierce. I'm going to tell both of our bosses about Hay. So we'll need to take precautions so Hay doesn't find out. No phones, no email. Alright, let me know uh, how you want to handle it. You step inside to concede the game to Stacy, suggesting she pick up the rest of the Friday night shift. Uh, she says it's too late for that. She's not too happy with you. Bolton, way to go. You and Dexler each take a cab and cash while she goes to see Skinner. You head to Pierce's home. You'd like to know how Dexler was at Skinner's address. Maybe she got it from Scully or Mulder. You think? You do as Dexler did, asking Pierce to talk with you outside without his phone, and tell him to meet you at a public parking garage. Pierce doesn't argue. You feel good coming to him with a, this cloak and dagger stuff, but uh, you've got the upper hand for once. Two hours later, all four of you have met up. Dexler tells them everything she told you. Pierce and Skinner are skeptical. Your source's identifying identity sounds legitimate, but we can't trust this intel or his motives. Not only that, but from what I understand, this Livelay person was at death's door. Not exactly. My recollection is that he was undergoing hyperbaric oxygen therapy and recovering at an unexpected rate. I remember this case, actually, from Mulder and Scully, the, you know, when they were on TV. I remember this one. I didn't see that anywhere in the case file. Neither did I. The medical report from the hospital seems to have been misplaced. Ask about the report. How often does that happen? People are getting lost in the shuffle. It happens, but not often. One thing my office excels at is tidy paperwork. Do you think maybe the report was removed from the case file? Taken by someone? Redaction happens quite a lot, as I'm sure you know. Pulling it aside or altogether, I wish I could say it. Uh, it's without precedent, but it's rare. Regardless, we need as much background details as we can get to act on what we uh, have. Sir, while you were reviewing Livelay's case file, I took a look at the Baltimore arson reports and autopsies. They've uncovered some disturbing details. Traces of some accelerant Livelay used were found at both scenes. Not only that, but localized burn patterns on the victims indicate sustained controlled fires. It took a long time to die. They were tortured. A bit of speculation there, Agent. I don't know, Greg. I think it fits. Still, we don't have a smoking gun. No one in the Bureau wants the X-Files taking an interest in an ongoing investigation of this magnitude. Suggest using Dexler's political allies. Suggest it's Smolder and Kelly's case. Suggest waiting it out. Hmm, well, Smolder and Scully. This Livelay case belongs to Agent Smolder and Scully. Shouldn't they be taking the reins on this? They're out of town on another case. I'll be sure to reach out to them discreetly for background. Listen. You are dealing with the, uh, still dealing with the effects of CO2 poisoning. Take some time off. Do what? Take some time off from official business. Uh, maybe a road trip would do you some good. The Baltimore. That sounds perfect, Agent Fulton. Go to Baltimore on your own time. Visit the uh, historic Inner Harbor or whatever else might intrigue you. The Pierce Institute will keep tabs on the arson case. You better professional... Out of professional interest, we'd like to help, of course. You look to Dexter to see if she's hearing what you are, that your bosses want you to investigate under the radar. 
She gives you a careful certain nod. You're really gonna do this? When you get home, Stacy's not there. She left a text telling you she's gone out and will be sleeping in her place. Just as well, seeing you as, uh, have some reading to do before bed. When you finally get some sleep, you dream of fire. The next morning, Dexler comes by to pick you up. You leave Stacy a text to tell her you'll be out of town for work. She'll love that. When Dexler stops for gas, you pay cash for a prepaid burner's phone, so no prying magic bullets can hear you talk to the bosses. It doesn't matter if they're tracking your phones now, they're probably expecting you to be in Baltimore. You just have to keep them out of earshot. Before you hit the road, Dexler suggests visiting a marine buddy who knows a firefighter to borrow some fire-resistant gear he owns. Dexler's buddy lives in western Maryland. Which means you're going an hour out of your way, but it could be worth them. Eh, you know what? This is literally the end of Story Escapes. Rest in peace, my friend. Get the fire gear. You think it's a good idea? Well, worth the extra time, so Dexler takes the I-270 to Gaithersburg. Everybody, Charlie is affable. With a dry sense of humor, he's thrilled to see Dexler, and it seems like someone you'd get along with. Charlie wants to catch up, but Dexler tells him that you're in a rush. You both thank him and get back in the car. By the time you're en route to Baltimore, it's obvious that Dexler's taste in music doesn't suit you. Something instrumental would do more than the shouts and riffs of 2000 NU's metal to keep you focused on the case. Ask for other music, change the station, let it go. Ask for other music. Can we change the music or station? I can't focus on the case with this stuff. You're not going to find anything, something that'll put me to sleep, are you? I'll try not to. You find a station during a set of ambient electronica. Leave it there. If I snore, wake me up. If you snore, I'm pushing you out and dinking the wheel. Dexter laughs haughtily. I'd like to see you try as you get down to business. You start by considering Dana Scully's prof profile to see a lively, that uh, of a sexually frustrated man engaging in power fantasy. It's an interesting take, but not one you necessarily agree with. Sending love letters to wives of his victims was a power move. But it didn't have to be sexual in nature. You think he was making up for a lack of self-worth, or being from a lower social class. Likely both. None of this helps you understand Lovely's current state of mind, or uh, impetuous. It doesn't track at all with torturing federal office workers. Hey, what do you have on the... Uh... On the victims. The first one was David Brack, and he worked the main directory. Divorced 40. Uh, the one from two nights ago was Mahir Asra, a human resources clerk, married 26. Both were fully vetted, had unclassified security clearance, they knew each other enough to chat at Bracken's desk, but uh, weren't friends. So they were given pointers on watching for tales, not, but not formally trained to. Wouldn't Bracken be armed at his desk? I don't think so. He was more of a friendly face for visitors and employees. Relative easy to track and subdue. Only thing in common is the FBI. Narrowing down some why someone would target federal employees felt like a bit of a fool's errand, doesn't it? You don't respond, letting the information sink in, looking for a patter. It would be so much easier if you could just ask Livalet himself. You could take a deep dive in your psyche, you f Likely, read everything you can about him. What do you have to lose? Mm. You know what? We've never done this. Why not? Take a few deep breaths. The dry eyelids fall. Your focus on the rhythmic rumble of the car. And you open your eyes. It's dark. There's no other traffic. You turn to the driver's seat. Cecile Livale is behind the wheel. He grins. I see you've got a ring of fire playing on the radio. Not too subtle, are you? Play whatever you want. You're driving, after all. Oh, that I am, that I am. I'll leave this on. I don't care one way or another, really. Lovely mugs at the rearview mirror and strokes his chin. Got me looking sharp, I have to say. Didn't age bad at all in your eyes. He's very much aware of being a construct of your mind. You'll have to focus harder. Don't do that! Mm, not the focus harder, Zen Master shit. We're fine just as it is. You get to know me, I get to know you. 
<clears throat> do you always do that? Having an inner voice that talks to you like it's someone else? Kind of mental, you ask me. I, li I like it. I just got his inner voice. What does your uh, inner voice in your head say to you? Oh! Nice turned about. Well, it doesn't speak as much as I pool. Uh, you know what I'm saying? It pulls me to do terrible things to offer people. I hope I feel I follow along. You know, and stands in my way, that's a bonus, speaking of. I just saw Agent Scully in your head. That red-head dart, as age will. Rawr! Mulder on the other hand, woof! Of course, that doofus never looked good. He should at least grow his hair out. Is that what uh, this is about? Scully and Mulder? You know, you don't even know the answer to that. Why did you even ask, genius? Come on, give me something good. Something with teeth. Ask why he kills. What is it at the core of what you do? What makes you want to murder? Well, let me explain something. I can do what no one else can. Control fire with my mind. You notice a distinct odor in the air, like a spent match. Fire is as beautiful as it is dangerous. It's mine. How would I wouldn't use it to do whatever I want? Those, these others you've invited into the back of your head in the past. Some are weak, driven by lack of willpower. Some are strong and compelled. Smoke starts to wave through the car. I'm strong, but I'm not compelled. I'm liberated. I don't kill out of greed or desperation or mental illness. I kill because I can. This part is, no one could stop me. No one. Hmm. Pro-flying aspect. So he likes control. He's very overbearing with his fire abilities. But this is your mind. I'll stop you, leveling. It's a promise. When you come right down to it, you're just another man. Oh, yes, you're a tough guy. I've been through some things. But how tough are you, really? How much could you survive? car accelerates, the dashboard lights up in a burst of flames. You feel the heat now, Agent Fulton. You feel it. Fire spreads, it's behind you, under the seats. You know it isn't real, but you actually feel it. The valet laughs. Burn, baby burn. The car might be going over a hundred. Neither of you can see where you're going. If you catch fire, you can't even open the door. This is what you have to look forward to, Agent Fulton. This is how you die. The valet has got a primal, a guttural scream as the fire takes hold. You feel your skin blister, pop, and it reaches your head, and your eyes snap open, you're ho hopping in your seat, patting yourself all over. You realize you're the one who's been screaming. Fulton, what's wrong with you? <clears throat> Dexler is pulled over on the interstate. You stop patting yourself, but you still feel hot. You're sweating. You were screaming, trying to open the door while I was driving. You unlock the door and step out in the fresh air. Look at the horizon. You breathe. Dexter comes out to check on you. Did you have some kind of nightmare? A condition? What the hell, man? I put Livale in my head. The profile him. Maybe I didn't get enough sleep last night. I don't know. Well, hell, Fulton. Could you please try not to do it while I'm freaking driving, at least? It was so real. Everything felt so real. Yeah, well, you've got a vivid imagination, and you're weird. You don't deny that claim. After a short time, you feel like yourself once more. <clears throat> Dexler gets back on the road. It's quiet at first, and the effects of your deep dive with Lively still linger in the dark corners of your mind. You remind yourself again that you may well find Lively has nothing to do with this. A guise isn't a reliable source. Dexler turns down the radio. This is pretty crazy, isn't it? We're tampering in an official vis investigation. We could get in a lot of trouble if we're found out. <clears throat> crazy. But necessary. I don't disagree. But if we can't look into Lively's involvement through proper channels, then it has to be done. Sitting idly by, knowing we could be instrumental in bringing justice and preventing more dust, I don't know that I could uh, handle it. I just hope Skinner doesn't hang us out to dry if, if this all goes bad. We're on our own dime. We have no proof he sent us out. 
Skinner has never been the type of guy to leave someone hanging. So, I'm going to reassure. Skinner wouldn't let us take the heat for this. He doesn't seem the time. You're probably right. Exer falls silent, most likely thinking about her career. With her academy grade, she would recover from disciplinary action. Unlike you. Hey, if this is it for us, we can open a PI firm, Dexter and Fulton Investigations. Drive around the country in a psychedelic van, solving mysteries. Yeah, but we don't have a talking dog. Anyway, I'm glad we paired up. You're good people, Fulton. <clears throat> sure there, Cinnamon. So are you, Dexler. Even with that catch-up you've had on your face all day. Not falling for it. In the corner of you, I catch Dexler glancing into the rear of you to get a look at her face. Your burner phone sitting on the console goes off. Your neck hairs do a dance. Who has the number? Besides me? Skinner, Pierce, Scully, and Muller. I had the bureau forward it to be an encrypted mail. When did you do that? When you hit the head at the gas station. Hmm. Oh, right. Good thinking, Dexler. I know. Dexler smirks to herself as she presses a button on the phone. Her own speaker with us both. <clears throat> it's Dana Scully. I went over the autopsies of the two Baltimore employees. You were right in your assessment. Agent Dexler, these two were tortured before they died. I know it was a long time ago, but is there anything you can tell us about Livelli? Aside from his medical charts, one thing missing from the case file was a bit of speculation. Prior to our encounter, there were two people named Cecile Livelli in the UK who died under suspicious circumstances. One was a kid who was burned alive as part of a satanic ritual, and the other was killed in a fire in the 70s. Hmm. Ask about the ritual. What do you know uh, about the supposed ritual? Name of a sect or any witnesses? Everything I read was from the newspaper article, so it was light on facts. I never had time to follow up with the Scotland Yard. For what it's worth, I'm more apt to believe Livelay has a genetic mutation to begin with rather than gaining his abilities from through the occult. If this man is in Baltimore, you need to be extremely careful. He's devious, sadistic, and has no reservations about murdering in cold blood. Did either of the victims have a wife? <clears throat> ah, the second victim dead. She was out of the town when it happened. Livelay has a thing for the victim's wives. I know the current deaths don't fit his pattern, but you may want to check on her. Thank her. <clears throat> Not a bad idea. Thanks for all the intel. Don't mention it. Stay safe. Indexer, reach the outskirts of Baltimore and find the kind of motel where only cash is accepted. No need for unwanted visitors. Dexter gets out one room with the two beds, a detail you doubt she'll mention to Stacy, even though she isn't the suspicious or jealous type. Dexter calls Skinner on the burner to brief him and to get the whereabouts of Mahir Hassar's widow, staying with her sister. The sun falls as Dexter drives across town. You roll up your window to avoid the creeping chill. Dexter pulls up to a modest home in a quiet neighborhood. Lights are on in the two rooms, but the drapes are drawn. Just to be on the safe side, Dexler opens the trunk and gear you up with the flame-resistant items you borrowed from Charlie. Well, how was that fed? A little loose, you. A little snug. Well, better than nothing, right? Everything seems fine at the house, but you can't help feeling tense. You remember how Martin Sneeberg Jr. froze you to within an inch of your life? You recall Coach nearly bashing your brains in... You can see Dexter feels it too, the way she looks at the house, like it could be haunted. She turns to you. Armed and ready, you? Same. Armed and ready. Let's go. You approach the front door, side by side. Dexter knocks. You wait. She knocks again, harder this time. You wait. She turn tries the door. It's unlocked. You draw your weapons. Dexter injures with you close behind. Front hallway is dark. The left is the living room, ahead of the kitchen. The lights are on in both rooms. Dexler signals that she'll check the kitchen. She signals for you to check the living room. You butt up against the entryway, weapon at the ready. You turn and enter, and you find... 
exactly what you'd hope you wouldn't. Walls, carpet, and furniture sawed with burn marks, and in the center of the room, two bodies huddled together. Burn beyond recognition, a perverse monument conceived by an evil mind. Dexler, in here! Dexler rushes over the kitchen and sees the tangled horror of the scorched carpet. God, oh god, we were too late. You barely want to breathe in the air, but beyond the small smell of burned paint and upholstery and flesh, you catch a whiff of something. You smell that? Chemicals. Accelerant. A creep from behind startles you both. You whip around, weapon drawn, and you can't believe what you see. A large flame dancing on the palm of his hand. He's aged poorly, looks sickly, but it's him. Live away. <coughs> I wouldn't shoot if I were in your shoes. It would end poorly for you, but not for me. Move and I'll shoot. Federal agent, you even twitch and I'll entire empty my entire my clip in your chest. Oh come now, did you not just hear me? Like I'm bluffing. Tell you what, just to calm your nerves, I won't move a muscle. The lady's expression changes from sinister to puzzle. He looked at me to Dexler, and then, with a spark of insight, back at you. Oh, I recognize the two of you. Fulton and Dexler last on the list. I should have looked you up before the local field mice. What list, Lemley? Oh, so you you know who I am. And you know what I'm capable of, so watch that toad, little girl. These silly fellows who broke me out said, Here, give these people for it. But they didn't count on me not giving a wit about their wants. Call themselves magic bullets, like I said, silly fellas, but at least they freed me. Got to respect them for that. Freed you from where? You don't know. It's been over 20 years locked away in some kind of torture chamber disguised as a science lab. Test after test after test! Boking and prodding, cutting, burning, all to see the limits of what makes me dick. Spot Dexler slowly moving, so level A can't target you both at once. You need to get his attention on you. Yeah, you don't know any of this. You don't lie to me. <laughs> Show surprise and sympathy. It sounds terrible. What was done to you? Tell me more about it. I can help bring those responsible to justice. The valet laughs until it becomes a cough. He's not well at all. Justice. Sure, I'd like to see a little justice. Dexter's almost far enough to give you two distinct advantage points on him. You can't focus on you both. You're going to find two more people for me. Fox Mulder and Dana Scully. Why? You tortured those employees. You were hoping they'd find out where Mulder and Scully live? You know who they are! They're still alive. Suggest you cooperate. If I lead you to them and you kill them, can you promise no one else will die? I'll die. I don't... I don't have very much long. The doctors, butchers, they ruined me. Left me a shell. I'd like to believe that you were so pragmatic as to help me out, but maybe you are, I don't know. But since you're distracting me as your partner can move, I don't trust you. You will bring them to me, but only because you'll be dead. The boy flicks his hand and a fireball launches at Dexter's feet reflexively. She leaps away from the fire, and her momentum propels her back through a window and out on the lawn. Livelay makes a run for it, he's close, but moving. You mind yourself that you're not a great child. Chase. <clears throat> you take off after Livelay catching his leg with your own. He falls into the kitchen. You train your gun on him within your hallway. Don't make me shoot. No, don't make me laugh. Without warning, the walls and kitchen entrance go up in flames, taking Livelay out of your line of sight. The blaze is immediately powerful and overwhelms and disorients you. You immediately cross your fingers that this special gear works. Pull up the hood and cover your head with your arms. You run through the fire into the kitchen. You don't burn, but it hurts. Lily's headed for the back door. You leap at him. Tearing the back pocket of his jeans as you hit the tile hall, Lily throws the door closed and sets it on fire. You get up shakily. Something white blocks one eye as the fire grows. So scrap of paper, you pocket it, and run out the back of the kitchen. You get out through the front door, but as the smoke billows, the growing fire bewilders you. You no longer know which direction is which. You stumble and fall in the living room, where the drapes are fully engulfed in flame. Smoke fills your lungs, you hack and spit, tear up. The room starts to tilt. Special Agent Jess Dexler. Must have blacked out. 
who knows for how long. I pick myself up off the grass to see the house is fully ablaze. Hulk could still be inside. I recall seeing a garden hose coiled around the corner. I could use it to douse the window, or I could try the front door. It's quicker. Use the window, or the hose. I shake off my dizziness and run to the spigot to turn it on. I lift the hose from the caddy and race back to the window. I spray, but it doesn't seem to be making any difference. Little bits of flame go out while others grow and howl. At this rate, it'll take several minutes at least for the window to be full clear of flame. I regret not having gone for the door. When Fulton leaps through the window, he takes some fire and frame debris with him, landing where I fell. Luckily, the gear was kept Fulton's burns to a bare minimum. I drag him away from the house. The water. Told me which direction to jump. I think that's why I use the water. Fulton looks at me with his sad, grateful bloodshot eyes. He got away livelily. It's not your fault. Don't blame yourself. We both tried. We but failed together. We weren't enough to stop him. I know how she he feels, though it's easy to take myself to task over this. I thought after my run-ins in Alaska and Philly, I'd be ready for this one. I wasn't. You never are. Bolton reaches into his pocket and hands me a slip of paper. Best place. What does that mean? Lively had it. So it meant something too lively. I hope we're able to make heads or tails of it. Yeah, but look at where it's written. On a B. We're looking for, like, a address, name. As a neighbor runs over to check on us, she says she called the fire department. One less thing to worry about. She runs back to her house for a first aid kit. I hope I got an ibuprofen in it. Maybe something stronger. If any vodka, be a coffee. I get an Irish coffee. Waiting for this uh, cinematic thingy to go away. <clears throat> oh, wait, we're not done. Friendly! Good episode. Good episode. So, without further ado, thank you all for watching. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe. And uh, do keep in mind that uh, this will be it, guys, for Storyscapes. I mean, I'll continue to do X-Files as well as uh, do the finale for Edge of Extinctions. I don't know if I'll have time to do Life 2.0 or Eternal City. I was going to pace myself, work on these things, and, you know, on top of the choices, and I've still got to do... Um, you know, the Vampire Girl for chapters, and as well as the 250 plus hours of content I do alone that are completely separate from um, the visual novels that I cover on this channel. So, you know, it's it's literally and figuratively a full-time job. So please remember, if you want to support this channel, it's very much appreciated. Um, I share my passions, I share my fun ventures and whatnot with you guys, and, and uh, hopefully, especially because you keep coming back, hopefully you're enjoying it. So, uh, remember, if, uh, if you're not able to access the stories anymore or whatnot after to, well, I guess tomorrow, that, uh, at least my videos will for, be up for forever. So, without further ado, thanks for watching. Catch you all next time. Peace.